Good evening. My name is April Pooley, and I'm a PhD candidate in the MSU Neuroscience Program. I researched the effects of traumatic stress on the brain, and I started on this path in October of 2011 when I did the most important internet search of my life. The internet, what some people think is the antithesis of human connection, actually brought me back to humanity when I googled four letters, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. I was in my first semester as a doctoral student when I did this search, and I had heard about PTSD in veterans, but I didn't really understand what it was or why it was such a big deal. And when I learned that it could be caused by a variety of experiences not related to military combat, I was intrigued. Things like car accidents, domestic violence, and rape. I thought it was a war disorder. And when I read the list of PTSD symptoms that day, I was floored because they read like a definition of my own life. Nightmares, hypervigilance, startling at sudden noises or movements, sleep problems, irritability, and the most jarring one to me, intrusive recollection or reenactment of the event in memories, daytime imagery, or dreams. Now, I had heard the word flashback before, but I always thought of it as someone falling to the ground during a thunderstorm or fireworks. But this description of a flashback really hit home. Intrusive recollection of the event in daytime imagery. Every single morning for the eight years leading up to this moment, I stood in my bathroom for hours, sometimes three, four hours, going over and over the events of the night I was raped at a fraternity house when I was 17 years old. It was like I was staring into the mirror watching a movie of that night in slow motion, just trying to figure out what happened and why. I would get up at 6 a.m. just to maybe be able to make it to my 10 a.m. class because I knew that every morning I would have to go through watching that movie and answering this list of questions like I was being interrogated. Why did my friends leave me there? What happened in the 16 hours I don't remember? Why was I paralyzed when I woke up? Is this just what happens when you drink? Should I call the police? Should I go to the hospital? Was I really raped? Would my friends still be friends with me if I hadn't told them what happened? Every morning for eight years, I was staring into what I just learned was a vortex of flashbacks. And now I was staring at what would soon become my official psychiatric diagnosis, PTSD. I felt so comforted by the fact that all of my problems could be explained by this four-letter acronym and that maybe I wasn't really just a crazy mess. The feeling that something horrible was going to happen any minute, like I was holding a live grenade, that was PTSD. My jumps and screams at the phone ringing, the doorbell chiming, the postman putting letters into the mail slot, my heart pounding up into my neck for hours at a time, waking up every 20 minutes at night to check my surroundings, that was PTSD. And up until this revelation, I thought I had just been dwelling in the past and feeling sorry for myself because I just couldn't get over it. I thought I was just a worthless alcoholic because the only way I could get out of the bathroom in the morning or attempt to sleep at night or to be alone or to be with people was to drink. And I was very drunk when I did this search for PTSD. In fact, it had been over five years since I had gone a single day without being drunk. But the hope and comfort that I felt at finally figuring out what was wrong with me didn't really last long because at the end of this search, I learned that there really isn't a very good effective treatment for PTSD, that symptoms can persist and continue to worsen over the course of a lifetime, and that suicide rates in PTSD patients are among the highest of any demographic group. The only hope really seemed to be counseling, and I wasn't about to go around telling a bunch of strangers all of the bad things that had happened to me. It was like I had just been given a death sentence. So I finished the rest of the whiskey in my bottle and I walked down the street to the quality dairy to get another. But being the scientist that I just happened to be, I could not give up there. I had to look for my own answers as to what PTSD really was and how maybe it could be treated. I thought maybe I could be part of some new experimental group. So I read hundreds of journal articles examining the effects of atypical antipsychotics, benzodiazepines, SSRIs, and even cancer medications on PTSD, some of which showed promise in animal studies, but more than half of PTSD patients failed to respond to these current standard treatments. But the most striking thing I noticed in this research was that almost all of these studies were only looking at human men or male rats. Nobody was looking at how these treatments work in women or if PTSD is even the same in women. 
And maybe I was just looking for something specific to women because I couldn't understand how what happened to me as a teenager could be the same as what happened to men in Vietnam. As many as one in 10 women suffer with PTSD, but this seemed to be overlooked by everybody. I certainly had never heard of it as a rape disorder. Medical research is historically notorious for predominantly studying men. Some scientists say that the differences between men and women really only matter with regard to reproduction, and some say that it's impossible to really scientifically study women because there's just too much going on with their periods and all those hormones. Seriously. <laughs> so I just kept doing my own research, uh, reading every article on PTSD I could find, and this went on for about a year, during which time I did end up finding a really good therapist. But even with going to therapy two, sometimes three times a week, and commitment to sobriety, I was still suicidal. I was relapsing all the time. I wasn't sleeping. I wasn't eating. Long story short, I wasn't getting much better. So I just kept thinking, if only the right research had been done, research on women, research on the actual brain mechanisms of PTSD, there would be a cure for me, and I wouldn't be failing at my recovery right now. I wanted to see more data, mechanisms of action, and have a step-by-step -step plan for how to get rid of my PTSD and my alcoholism once and for all. I was a very stubborn scientist, but I'm also very impatient, and science was moving a little too slowly for me. So I finally realized that my life is not a textbook, and recovery is not an experiment with a beginning and an end, and I acknowledged that I really had no idea what I was doing, that I finally began to find some relief. I started working with my therapist, doing breathing exercises, journaling exercises, letting myself scream at the top of my lungs. I did EMDR therapy, where I followed this little light back and forth while I thought about traumatic memories. All of these things I considered to be pseudoscience. But my nightmares and flashbacks actually started to go away. I began to startle less easily. But my real healing came when I started connecting with other people. There were so many people out there, so many women who, like me, had been raped or abused and had no idea that the reason they couldn't just get over it was because they were suffering from PTSD. I had to tell them. I thought I had this big secret that if all these traumatized people knew they had PTSD, they would be okay. But it wasn't sharing my scientific knowledge of PTSD that helped people. It was sharing my story, which is exactly the opposite of what I wanted to do. I wanted to show people diagrams of the brain and bar graphs of stress hormones. This is your, oh no, I'm missing a slide. This is your brain on trauma. But as the people I was talking to started sharing their stories, I started sharing mine. Not my personal story, but not my science story, but my personal story of rape, of abuse, of addiction. All of the darkness within me of which I was so ashamed. But once it was out there with everybody else's darkness, it didn't really seem so dark after all. And that's when I started getting involved in all of these things like lobbying for women's health care policy. I shared my story at survivor gatherings and art shows. I started getting involved in helping victims of sexual assault on campus. I started a blog about these issues. I wrote a book. I joined activist and advocacy groups. And I'm telling you this because this is when my shame and my guilt went away. Shame and guilt are two of the most insidious forces that can take over your life after trauma and destroy your self-worth, your ability to form relationships with other people, and even your will to live. I was so ashamed I had gotten raped. I was ashamed I didn't call the police. I felt guilty for the years that I wasted on drugs and alcohol, and I felt guilty for the brief moments of emotions that I did feel because they were filled with anger. I don't think any amount of science will ever find a cure or a pill for shame and guilt that doesn't involve sharing your story, your human experience with another human being. We need to be seen for who we are, to be heard, to be accepted, and to be believed. There's a human element to recovery that we often forget. It's not surprising to me that the single greatest risk factor for developing PTSD after trauma is lack of social support. More than any contribution made by one's genes, other biological characteristics of an individual, or aspects of the trauma itself, it's social support that has the largest influence on whether someone will develop PTSD. 
Socially supported people are allowed to talk about what happened to them, to experience and express their emotions without judgment or ridicule, to cry and scream and do whatever their body needs to do to discharge all that energy. With proper social support, human connection immediately following trauma, the likelihood of recovery is exponentially greater. But even though it had been almost 10 years since my trauma when I found this kind of social support, I still suddenly found this peace that I didn't even know existed. I didn't even know I was looking for it. After nearly a decade of alcoholism, I've now been sober for two years. After a decade of loneliness, I'm now married to the love of my life. And after a decade of PTSD, I can now finally sleep at night. So as it turned out, it wasn't that there needed to be more research in the field of traumatic stress to help me. I needed to find my way back to humanity. But with that being said, even though science and medication alone will probably never fully cure PTSD, I am still chipping away at it because I do believe there's value in understanding how the world around us and within us works. Maybe we can at least make a, find a way to make this journey a little less painful. When I was in it, as I like to say, my life revolved solely around my will to survive. But when I was able to shift my focus on a will to help other people, I found peace, sobriety, and love. And I wouldn't have had the strength to do that if it wasn't for the people in my life who helped me first. The will to survive is an innate human driving force. But the will to help other people and make the world a better place is precisely what makes us human. And that's what we should all be striving for. So despite my attempts to avoid connecting with people because I was ashamed of who I was and because I was scared, it ended up being humanity, the very same humanity that I thought had betrayed me that ended up saving me. And I am so grateful for every person who has told me that my blog post or my book gave them the courage to face another day because that's what this is all about. Using all of the resources we have, whether it's the internet or medication or counseling or science or art or music or yoga, to bring the people who have been so traumatically severed from humanity back to us because each and every one of us matters. And I have to end with a picture of my family because without them, I would not be here today. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.